June 15th, and this is of course the video log. It takes 30,000 to a million. Haven't made a video in a week. So apologize if uh, some of you are waiting for the video. Um, on, let's see, what, what was it? Today's Monday, so Thursday night. I usually do Monday night, Thursday night now. So apologies for that. But today, hopefully, I make up for it by giving you four reasons as to why I'm bullish and maybe you can be bullish on the nominal price of the stock market overall, stocks in general. Um, so one of the reasons is very elaborate. So maybe I'll, because um, I'm merging a few reasons together. Anyways, moving on, let me show you the account real quick, where I'm sitting at, and then uh, we'll talk about, we'll talk business, all right? So here is the account, I'm sitting at 90,130 which is about where I am, where I was the last time I made a video, but a lot has happened since then. And you'll be surprised that I'm about the same level because I had a monster day today. You can see $4,000, but it's actually not that big. There was just a lot of uh, pre-market and aftermarket action that makes this number look really big. But uh, nevertheless, 4.73% when the market was only up like a percent. So I'm definitely beating the market there and I'm super happy about that. Now, what has happened? Well, I actually went all the way up to 93,000. I didn't log that in though. I should have uh, made a video to log it in, but I'm sure that I'll, I'm gonna reach those heights, highs at some time in the future, in the near future, hopefully. All right, now if you wanna know my exact positions, as always, you can pause the browser, look at these option plays. You can see the um, symbol you can see the the strike price of the call, the expiration date, and the amount of contracts I have. One sell, boom, and this is the daily change of the value of that contract. You can pause and you can see all the positions I have. These are all the option positions, and then I will show you all of the, of course, the Apple position here. The um, these are buys. I have three buys here. Actually, I have more than three buys. I think I have silver calls. Let me scroll up real quick. Silver calls, yep, three of them expiring on June 3rd, so in 15 days. Should be interesting. I think they're gonna make money, let me see. I'm gonna click them real quick. This is on the fly. These are always improvised video logs. They're not rarely uh, structured. So um, I'm up 66% on it, $109. I've sold quite a few of those actually for profit. But it looks like the break-even price is 16.05 on the SOV. And let's see if they're likely to make money. Right now I'm in the money, so 16.26. Hopefully silver goes up in the next 15 days. I'll be making a little bit of money. All right, so moving on from the option plays, here is my stock positions and a lot of them have options sold against them so it's not really an accurate representation but I just wanna I want you to show you like what what I'm playing with okay so here's EXK that's uh, of course silver Apple 75 shares now instead of 80 so I sold five shares to kind of lighten up position and do leverage I'll show you my leverage uh, ratio in a second so main uh, realty income about 10 extra shares make that 15 so it was doing pretty good up 3.54 percent today overall I'm positive almost 10 percent on this and I don't have option call sold against this so these these are just I'm in the money here profiting okay if I sold now I would have a realized profit I have currently an unrealized profit if you don't know what that difference is I just told you if you have gains on a position it's called unrealized profit and if you sell the position it's called realized profit that means that you're gonna get taxed on it <laughs> okay all right so uh, you can see that it occupies eight percent of my account which is quite big and that number is gonna get larger I have puts sold against oh ones that expire on 717 619 a $50 put 42.5 put and a $40 put this 42.5 I would probably buy back because it's nearly zero but I'm just gonna later write out and collect the extra dollar because I have to pay five dollars in order to uh, close the position it's the minimum unfortunately 
So it's uh, instead of losing $5, I'm going to gain one. $6 swing. It's worth waiting for. Okay. Uh, sometimes it's not that, especially if you have a really large contract. You want to close it out because then the opportunity cost is too big. You What that means is uh, the opportunity cost means that you could have done something else with that money, right? You don't want it sitting. It's called like dead money. You don't want it sitting doing nothing. Okay, enough about realty income. $7,300 there. That's pretty big. All right, NYMT has been recovering really nicely. If you own these, some of these mortgage trusts, they've been recovering, super recovering really well from huge lows. Obviously, they're not beating their all-time highs like other companies. So you'd be worse off if you held them through the uh, COVID scare. But nevertheless, the percentage gains are big if you bought at the bottom. Wheat and Precious Metals, plus 134. Really nice gains here, especially considering this isn't a very large position. Uranium's doing okay. It's about flat. It goes chemical, minus 300. The day started really far in the negative, actually, uh, if you were following it. The futures were down over 2%. I think the S&P maybe or the Dow was down 3%. And the markets managed to recover all the way into positive territory and give me a huge gain at the end of the day. Oh, look, market reset. Now uh, it says zero here. Should have taken a screenshot for the video thumbnail, but now it's going to be an empty one. <laughs> so we'll see what it looks like. Okay, now as promised, I'm going into the account to show you the margin ratio. And it looks like I only have $670 on margin, which is 0.74% of the account. This means that I'm pretty much, for all intents and purposes, completely deleveraged from the account. So now my gains are probably going to be more muted than they have been thus far. <clears throat> However, I'll be saving myself from having to pay interest on this margin, which is what happens when you buy stocks on margin. So if you have a margin, Robinhood margin account, and you aren't aware of that for some reason, now you are. You have to pay interest on your margin money which is 5% if you are curious. Still worth taking. I have $90,800 in assets that I'm controlling right now. If I didn't deleverage, this number would be well over 100000 right now. Um, but perhaps the total uh, market, val market value of the, I'm sorry, the uh, value of the account, not the market value, would probably would may have been less if I didn't deliver. Who knows? Because I sold some stuff that went down afterwards, so it's hard to say. Okay, so that's the account. Uh, this graph, as always, doesn't really tell you much, even though it looks cool. All right, going back to the account now. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. How four reasons that I even have minor notes for the reasons down for you that to be bullish on this market right now and I got to be very careful to say the nominal value of the account not the because I'm not very bullish on the economy okay I think there's super uh, huge problems worldwide structurally not just with trade wars not just with rules in competitions based and and nationalism arising and the decline of globalism or, or at least the start thereof at the very least through political means but also because of the virus situation um, there are many many negatives out there and I think the recovery is going to be very slow and, and, and tedious not tedious but painful I think it's going to be painful um, so, but however, I do think that the market, at least nominally, what that means is just the number, the price of it in terms of dollars will go up. So the number that you see when you when the Dow is quoted, it's quoted in U.S. dollars, right? So that number is going to go up. It doesn't mean that the actual value, the purchasing power that the market will have if you were to sell it, will be greater. This means that the number will be greater. <laughs> so 
So what am I talking about? Like, how does this make any sense? What I'm saying, if you're still confused, let's say the Dow is 10,000. Um, well, what's the Dow right now? Let me take a look. Dow is 26,000, a little bit over 26,000 as I speak in the futures. So $26,000, that number is going to increase. And let's say these $26,000 can buy me 100 hamburgers, okay? If the Dow goes to 30, and it will go higher, let's say the Dow goes 30, eventually it will, 30,000, but now that $30,000 Dow buys me 95 hamburgers, okay, or still buys me 100 hamburgers, it has increased nominally, but it has decreased or stayed even in real terms. Okay, real terms factors out what's called inflation. If you're not familiar with those terms, it's definitely worth reading up on. So anyways, I think that's going to go up, and that's why I'm still invested near, pretty much like 90% bullish right now in my account, 80 to, 85 to 90%. And I always want to be over 55% bull. I was about 50, 60% <clears throat> bull right before the COVID scare. And I thought I was playing it really, really well. But unfortunately, my cash reserves and my bonds that I sold to buy stocks, I bought stocks too early. I've talk about, talked about that mistake before, so I'm not going to repeat myself. Going into the reasons now, I'm dragging this way too long. Number one reason that I think the market is going to go nominally higher is inflows. Now, I've talked about this before. What inflows are is the, par the portion of the checks that people deposit into their 401k accounts, into their IRAs, into their Roth IRAs every single month. Uh, I guess you could include active investment by retail investors that do it regularly, you can include that too. Um, you know, all this money that goes into pension funds and, and retirement accounts, etc. That happens once a month for basically everyone that's employed and that works for a large ish company, at least. So, regardless of the underlying value of the assets, they're going to get bought up continuously month over month over month which is i think one of the main reasons why asset prices like the stocks keep going up over time over and over especially in modern in the modern era right in the last 30 40 uh years or 50 years given so inflows i think are a very very important part okay that means it's it's a kind of kind of a blind investment right Regardless of what's going to happen, the price of these assets are going to go up. Even if their real value is not that high, their price is still going to get bid up. And I think that's really important for nominal price move of the markets. Number two is the Federal Reserve. Okay. So, uh, the Federal Reserve is the Central Bank of the United States of America. Other countries and country unions also have central banks. For example, the ECB, okay, the European Union Central Bank, or the Bank of Japan, right? <clears throat> central Bank of Japan. China has a central bank. Virtually every country out there has a central bank, especially ones that have um, their own currencies. Central bank plays a very important role there because it manipulates the value of the currency through many internal mechanisms. So our central bank is in charge of the US dollar and it doesn't just take care of the US dollar, it actually tries to manipulate the economy, the markets by actively going into the markets, which they're not even hiding anymore, and purchasing things like corporate bonds, Things like mortgage-backed securities, which they've done in 2008. Things like 
corporate bonds, no, uh, I mentioned that, um, U.S. Treasuries, right, U.S. bonds, so which they do regularly on the daily. And um, if you want to know how much, I think the numbers are out there in plain sight, just go to the Fed website and you can see how what they're purchasing and whatnot. So they're manipulating things and it's it's not very politically expedient to have a falling market. Okay, a lot hinges on the markets for politicians, for central banks. Nobody, no central bank, banks are want to res, wants to reside over a declining market, even if that means that the currency that they're controlling is going to be more sound. A sound currency just means that it's more proper. Like it's um, it's the way things are supposed to be done. Okay, so for for a healthy economy. So nobody wants that. So they all sacrifice a little bit of the dollar and they try to manipulate the markets in a way that's that's going to leave them off in a favorable terms by everybody. You know, they try to make things somewhat stable. They want to please the governments by creating uh, a negative real rate interest rate so they can inflate their debt and um they do all kinds of things to prop up the markets. It's no coincidence that every time there is a big dip in the market, some type of Federal Reserve official will go up on the news and will say something like, we've introduced a new program to purchase blah, 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 blah over this period of time, and we're going to commit $100 billion per month or whatever in order to do that. So, And they're directing that towards... <clears throat> big fund managers, <clears throat> pension fund managers, etc., wealthy individuals, because they're telling them basically, hey, look, we are not going to get, we're not going to let the asset values decline in nominal terms. We're just not going to happen. So for that reason alone, I never want to be less than 55% bull on any of my accounts. So that's your Federal Reserve. Um, and they also manipulate the denominator, right? So if the dollar is getting weaker over time, which is historically true over the last hundred and some years, then you know that everything denominated in dollars will go up in relative terms. Now, third reason, which is a long one, is the fiscal stimulus slash low taxes. All right, so what does fiscal stimulus mean? Is that check that you got the $1,200 in the mail, most of you probably got it. A few of you didn't. because Well, you're probably not listening to this video log if uh, you didn't get it because you earn way too much money. But <clears throat> that's what fiscal stimulus is, okay? It's that. It's government spending of all kinds. It's governments hiring people to do projects for them. It's governments paying money to the military or to any kind of arm of the government. You know, um, all the environmental agencies and the IRS or whatever. So everything that the government spends on, that can be considered fiscal stimulus or disaster relief. That could also be considered fiscal stimulus. So the fiscal stimulus is has been larger now than I've ever witnessed, even during the financial crisis or the 911 even the wars that we waged after 911 so there's been a lot of dollars that are slushing around the economy right now that's been they've been introduced by the government and those are the kind of dollars that go directly into the people like us and um, those people either invest their money or they spend them in either case that's good for businesses and so the earnings of these businesses rise and so people who are sitting on the sidelines with cash or foreign currency they buy these businesses because their valuations look more attractive now because they earn more nominal dollars so domestic investors like most most of us or foreign investors they choose to trade their Rupia or yuan or uh, Australian dollars or Japanese yen or something <clears throat> and they purchased they purchased 
they purchase U.S. stocks with that, with that money. So, which are nominated in dollars, and they need dollars to buy them, so they trade in the currency for dollars, and then the dollars buy them the stocks. Uh, so that creates a, a little bit of demand for extra demand for the U.S. dollar. It, it creates extra demand for the U.S. securities, and the combination of all this is something that I have to thank. Actually, uh, I think he's a doctor. I'm not sure. It's Steve Keen, who I think has a really interesting understanding of the monetary system, and when he speaks, it really like puts things in perspective. Like he's not the only person I listen to. Of course, uh, I'm a big proponent or not proponent, but a, a fan of Austrian economics. That's the country of Austria, okay? But it doesn't actually have much to do with the country itself. I think just a lot of the economists came from there. So that are talk, they're talking about the school of thought. And so you can read up on that. <clears throat> and also Steve King, which is, who's not an Austrian, but he's got a very interesting perspective. And so he was, uh, not too long ago, he was calling... He was he was asked what is what 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 needs to happen in order for the situation to improve and he basically talked about a debt jubilee so you know basically giving a bunch of cash that is spent by the government to fix all the debts of people to eliminate the debt but and we've had something like that already just now with this twelve hundred dollars uh, a lot of the debt has been eliminated I'm sure some of the consumers some of the citizens of the U.S., right, that they've got the checks. They use them to pay off debt. But it's not just the pain of, of debt. A lot of them actually invested money into the market, okay, directly. I mean, they bought per they bought stocks. So here you have now, you know, let's say 200 out of that 1,000 is invested into stocks directly. That's a lot of money, okay, bidding up stock prices. <clears throat> so that's, you know, it's a reason in and of itself to be nominally bullish on the stock market. Now, I'm not saying that it's not going to crash tomorrow, like 10, 15%, but I definitely think by election time, or at least after the election, it, 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 there's just too much pressure for the markets to go up. Even if I don't believe necessarily that the economy is going to make a, a swift recovery, it may be in kind of this low productivity rate for quite some time. So it's going to be a battle between the... Uh, no, you know the Federal Reserve inflows, fiscal stimulus, etc. To um, <clears throat> on one side, and then the other side is the stubborn, unprofitable companies that we have to invest in. And the last reason, reason number four, is fintech. I mean, this has been a, I think, a tailwind for the nominal value of markets for quite some time. And that's definitely gotten some heat in recent news because everybody's jumping on the Robin Hood Knights, Robin Hood Knights or whatever you want to call us, uh, talking about people like me and possibly you. Because supposedly we're buying Hertz <laughs> and bidding a bankrupt company 5x, 500%. I'm not doing it. Tell me if you are. But I'm not buying bankrupt companies, but apparently many people who have Robinhood, you know, they probably went out and straight used their stimulus checks to buy Hertz, which is a bankrupt company. It's kind of ironic, but I'm sure there's plenty of cases of people doing that. But this this has been a tailwind for quite some time. You know, these apps like, like um, Acorn and um, Webull, you know, Robinhood, M1 Finance, Wealthfront has made the investment world very accessible for the regular person. Uh, I think that's why, it's one of the reasons why I really like started like investing much more is because I'm able to use a platform like Robinhood that looks friendly, it's easy to understand, I can explain it to other people and I don't have to look at a bunch of you know complicated technical instruments that uh, give me a headache after a while. Not that I don't understand them, like I know how to place trades on interactive brokers or let's say the e-trade platform but it's just not as enjoyable of an experience and I really want to love what I do in order for me to keep going um, and be more involved so I got Robinhood to thank for that because he gave me a fun platform that I can invest on 
and hopefully you guys are enjoying it too. If you use that, if you use other platforms, let me know what you're using. I'm interested to know whether you use Weibo or M1 or whatever you, you use. So I think FinTech has really brought the regular person into the market and what that's going to do is most people are probably going to lose their money, okay? They're going to lose their shirts, but the few that do, they don't and they actually learn from their mistakes and maneuver. Now you have a whole new crop of investors out there that have mastered that wouldn't be even available if it wasn't for fintech, right? So let's uh let's let's think about it in terms of sports, okay? So let's say you have um, I'm a, I used to be a tennis pro, so let's just like take tennis for example. Let's say you have 10 tennis courts um, in the country, just 10. So how likely is it that the level, you know, how many people are going to be able to play tennis, first of all, and how many are going to get good at the sport if you have to share these 10 courts among the entire population? I mean, you might get a little bit of practice time. It's going to be expensive. Only the super rich will be able to play on the tennis courts and then... Um, Either that or there's going to be some revolt and people are going to start climbing over the fences and taking over tennis time. All right, so it's basically, there's not going to be many tennis experts out there, right? In relative terms, there will be because somebody will be the best. But the talent pool overall is going to be small, okay? So if you want to know what sport is the most competitive out there, you have to look at the overall talent pool and... The largest sport is always the most competitive because I can invent a sport right now. It was just me and my buddy, right? Our talent pool is very small, so our expert level is not likely to be very high. So you can make your own conclusions there. I've had this discussion with many sportsmen before. <laughs> okay, so moving back onto the tennis courts. Now, if I decide to, the popular term for this, the buzzword is democratize. Uh, tennis and I build another hundred thousand tennis courts now the talent pool that I can draw from is much much larger so the competition is going to get bigger many more successful tennis players will reach and surpass the level of previous stars and that's what we're getting right now and I'm a fan of it I really am and so I think that's been a tailwind and continue to be a tailwind for the nominal at least um, stock market prices. So there you have it. You have four reasons that I'm bullish on the stock market and not to be confused with actually bullish on the stock market. I just think that the number is going to go up for some of those reasons, uh, but we may actually enter into a very slow growth or no growth or negative growth environment for some time, maybe a few years, maybe longer. Perhaps until the demographics, population trends reverse or stabilize or some other innovation comes our way and, and uh, boosts productivity, kind of like the internet did or telephones or whatever. All right, so that's my four reasons. This has been a very long video. Um, I definitely want to know if you watched all the way and enjoyed it. Even if you didn't enjoy it, maybe learn something. But even if you don't, just if you watch this video all the way, um, type down into the comments the word inflow <laughs> okay inflow so I know that you watched it all the way because I appreciate y'all all right I'm gonna conclude right there long one today Woo. peace out